six, seven. Should be out of ammo now. I he keeps going eight. Welcome to History Legends, this is part 3 of my military breakdown of the movie Hacksaw Ridge. Don't forget to watch part 1 and 2, and this is not whether the movie is good or not, it's what you can learn about it from a historical perspective. My friend Mike Ackerman helped me with this video, more on that later. As always, before we start, don't forget to like, hit the bell and subscribe, and check out my unique veterans book, link in the bio. One aspect that is correct is the time of the Japanese attack. Records from the Battle of the Maeda Escarpment aka Hacksaw Ridge mention how the Japanese usually carried out these attacks around 5am. During the day, American troops would have a clear field of fire and their firepower could stop any Japanese push. However, at night, the Americans would constantly launch star shells into the sky in order to light up the area. So any major enemy formations preparing an attack would be quickly spotted and bombarded. So the Japanese decided to attack right in between these two periods where they were the most vulnerable. From what I told you, we can understand that the goal of the Japanese was to remain stealthy. So obviously they did not scream like what we can see on screen. But Mel Gibson just couldn't help himself. And there's another thing that uh, I wanted to show you. It's this. Did you see it? Check this out here, right here. Why are the Japanese soldiers so fat? In his book with the old breed, Eugene Sledge mentioned how the Japanese looked pitiful as they only weighed 90 pounds at most. By early May, Japanese soldiers would have depleted most of their body fat and they would have looked skinny. Okay, the Japanese are attacking. Why are they standing up? It doesn't make sense. Okay, quick pause. The enemy is attacking. You are hidden in foxholes and you have a clear field of fire on the enemy. What do you do? You stay camouflaged in your position and you fire. Why are you going to stand up? And obviously, the moment they stand up, casualties start to rise. Now, the only way standing up would make sense is if they want to retreat and run away. That's okay, but not to fire at the enemy. I, I find it a bit odd. They're literally overweight. Wow. <laughs> Here, we, we could think that the entire Japanese army is coming for the Americans. For your information, there was only one Japanese regiment to defend the hill against multiple American regiments on the other side. And the Japanese did not have much reinforcements to replace casualties, so this would not have been possible. So now the problem is that you have the first line that wants to retreat, the second line can't fire because the buddies in the front line are retreating. I think it was here. Oh, I, I was here. Okay, it's pretty subtle. Before you get too excited, there were no actual Benzai attacks during the Battle of Okinawa, or more specifically during the Battle for the Maeda Escarpment. By that I mean human waves charging with their bayonets. 
Of course, it looks cool in movies and video games, but the truth is that the majority of these guys would instead be carrying grenades in groups of 20 to 50 men. Crawl as close to the enemy as possible and throw them from a camouflage position and then pull back. The reason is simple. The Japanese general saw that Benzai attacks was just a waste of human lives, so he told his troops to not do this anymore. Defend the positions at all costs, and if you have to attack the enemy, use harassment tactics. Guerrilla warfare. Okay, one thing I noticed is that the Japanese are a bit too slow. It might look fast to you, but if you're actually charging with a bayonet charge like this, you want to cut the distance from the enemy as fast as possible. They're jogging, they're not charging. And they're wasting too much time finishing off the wounded soldiers. This would be a task for the second or third wave if they want to. The goal here is to overwhelm the entire American line. Just picture this and imagine them coming at you and you don't even have something to defend yourself. And the moment you're done your ammo, you don't know what to do. So it's true that the Japanese famously used tunnels during the Battle of Okinawa. However, this was a well-known fact and the Americans actually prepared for it. However, the important thing you have to know from this is that the Japanese would not attack from the tunnels. They were for defensive purposes to protect themselves from American firepower. But what I believe is that Mel Gibson used this line as a religious metaphor to show how the Japanese are like demons rising from hell. And if you pay close attention to the movie, you'll see much more religious metaphors, but that's for another time. All the time! Oh my god! Ever since Saving Private Ryan, every movie maker loves having the radio guy get shot at the most important moment in every damn movie! And let's be picky. Check this out. We clearly see how the guy gets shot from behind. The guys are coming from forward. How did he get shot from behind? It's a complete mystery. If you're going to use this overdone stereotype, at least make it logical. Although it's cool to have a radio on the battlefield, it's kind of misinterpreted here. If you watch parts 1 and 2, you'll understand that the battle for the Maida escarpment lasted multiple days and the Americans would take the hill, retreat, go back and this for days and days. And during the retreats atop the Maida escarpment, the Americans would not call in artillery because the area was so small. Instead, they would call in smoke shells to cover their retreat. One time, they called 400 smoke shells to screen the withdrawal of a company that was stuck under a Japanese attack. So in a situation like this, the captain would not call for a naval bombardment that would literally blow all his men at the same time, but for a smoke screen to cover their retreat. Now you might say, what's the point of having a smoke screen against a bayonet charge? But like we said before, the Japanese did not attack with bayonet charges, but they would attack with mortar fire, grenades, anything they could launch. So if you can't see where you're throwing your grenade, it's kind of pointless. But there are cases where some American troops called in a bombardment on their own position, but it was pretty rare. And they usually died during this move. Come on guys, this is not Call of Duty. Thanks to video games, the common misconception is that the flamethrower was just another primary weapon used by the infantry, just like the Thompson or the Bar. The M2 flamethrower was a device used to eliminate Japanese fortifications. 
It used a 4 gallons of gel fuel, nitrogen propellant, a pyrotechnic ignition cartridge, and it could fire 20 to 40 yards for 10 seconds until it was out of fuel. Yes, 20 seconds at most, and it was done. It was literally a disposable tool. The harness even had a quick release latch for this reason. It would be fired on the fortification, dropped, and then taken back to the rear echelon to be recharged. So if we wanted this scene to be somewhat more realistic, the American guy would have fired his flamethrower and then released it, dropped it, and run away. And what I don't like, there's some part right here. Check this out. Look at the Japanese soldiers. They're burning. But that's not how the flamethrower worked. Long story short, it was a horrible weapon which made the, the guy that was targeted just melt. You would melt. So the, the reality was much more gore than what we could imagine. And of course, now we have the mandatory flamethrower explosion moment. And you can thank Saving Private Ryan for this idea. But don't worry Saving Private Ryan, I'm preparing a video just for you. Actually multiple videos. What would actually happen if the fuel cylinders were shot? The pressurized nitrogen and napalm would just leak out. The weapon would simply be disabled. Now you might say that a lot of veterans actually mentioned that flamethrowers would actually explode. Well, the only real danger the flamethrower posed to the operator was if the small tank in the center filled with pressurized nitrogen was hit. However, it would not erupt in a fireball, but it could explode like an aerosol can and lodge shrapnel into the operator or others around him. I believe this is what veterans witnessed when they said that the flamethrower operator blew up. And I think this is where the myth started. And before I press play again, I just want to mention how, how come the Japanese did not fire all their machine guns right at the beginning of the attack just to make sure that the Americans can't fire back. But of course, I think this makes too much logic, right? They really want to make the Japanese look like brain dead soldiers. So we know they have rifles and ammunition, so why don't they actually use it and fire from a camouflage position and not simply run into gunfire? That's the first point. And if you're going to charge, make sure you have a bayonet. Not even all of them have a bayonet. What's the point of charging then? And again, we have another Japanese machine gun that just aims at one character instead of spraying the entire field and has spot on aim to target the legs like it doesn't even shoot all over the body or whatever no just anyway it, it, i'm just getting mad now that i'm done my little rant there's something i actually like about this scene the battle for the maida escarpment was so hard that american officers did fight on the front line with their men in the first battalion 307th Infantry, no less than 8 company commanders were wounded in 36 hours. That's basically all of them. The battalion had gone up the ridge on April 29th with 800 men, and within a week, just over 300 came back. I say that the battle for this ridge was like World War I. The Americans would send in a regiment, battalions, they would get destroyed and they would get replaced by another. And the Japanese would have loved to do the same, but they had barely any reserves, so the Japanese regiments would just die on the spot. So this is why portraying the Japanese as just charging relentlessly, not caring about casualties, is just not accurate of the situation they were facing on Okinawa. Especially since the Americans had superior firepower and a numerical advantage.
Okay, back to the main character at least. Is it me or every time they cut from this ridiculous battle, it just gets more interesting the moment they focus on the medics. I just wish there were more of this because like I mentioned in the previous video, this movie is about Desmond Doss and not necessarily the battle of Okinawa. So I understand they wanted to make an action movie at the same time, but at least add a lot more scenes of what being a combat medic in the Pacific actually meant. Look, this guy's a bit overweight. No offense, but... They all look too well-fed. The American soldiers suffered so much on the battle. They would be tired, hungry. We don't feel this. The Japanese too. Okay, the guy is just... I got bad and then I forgot what I wanted to say. I just noticed that none of the Japanese soldiers actually have helmets. Okay, just watch again. Okay, no helmets. Why? This is a textbook rule on how to make the enemy look stupid. Now the other thing is that if we play this super slow, we can see that he fired twice, three, four, five, six, seven, should be out of ammo now. I, he keeps going, eight, nine, ten, it doesn't stop. His gun only has seven bullets. It's very picky, but it shows you how much effort they put in details. Oh, I think there's more, 12, 12 bullets, it doesn't end. The thing is, I remember watching this movie for the first time and I was actually shocked, I liked it, and I thought it was realistic. But then I did more digging about this movie and it completely changed my perception of what they were trying to show. So it looked um, gruesome and bloody and all this. So you think it's realistic, but when you dive more into it, it doesn't make sense. Okay, for example, we get it. The movie does a tremendous job at portraying the Japanese soldiers like demons coming right from hell that would rather die than surrender. But here, the Japanese are winning. What's the point of blowing yourself up for, for one guy? However, yes, wounded Japanese soldiers were known to booby trap themselves. So when an American approached, they would have a grenade ready to blow them up. And this is famously shown in episode one of the Pacific. Only severely wounded troops would do this as a final act of duty. And they would do this after a battle when the Americans are securing the area, not in the middle of a battle. But like in a lot of war films, this entire Japanese kamikaze trope is highly exaggerated here. Okay, but this part coming... I don't know, it's actually very bad. <laughs> they have these mortar rounds ready to be thrown. It's like darts, you know? Is it actually possible to use 60mm mortar rounds like grenades? Surprisingly, yes. But by no means it was a common occurrence. In fact, there are only two instances of this being done during all of World War II for the Americans. The first was Charles Kelly during the Italian campaign and the second was Beaufort T. Anderson during the Battle of Okinawa. Both of these men were awarded the Medal of Honor for being brave enough to use this crazy method. So we could believe that this guy using mortar shells like hand grenades would be an homage to Anderson. On this case, I'll say okay, it's fine because 
even though Anderson fought on another ridge, it's still a memorable moment of the overall battle of Okinawa. Okay, this is actually well portrayed. Check this out. American soldiers were not trained to fight in hand-to-hand -hand combat, or rather, they were not expected to, so they would usually just pull back. However, when they did engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the Japanese, it often turned really bloody. One time, within half an hour of close quarter fighting, Company K was repulsed with heavy losses, and survivors withdrew under smoke. Company K was now down to 24 men from an initial 120. Company K was then combined with Company I. Together, they added up to 70 men, 4 machine gunners from the heavy weapons company and 1 artillery observer. It's really crazy losing 80% of your fighting strength in half an hour. Now, I wished they showed something like this in the movie, but no. Okay, this is actually pretty realistic here. All the grenades exploding. You see, this little part with all the explosions is as close you can get to the real feeling of fighting for Hacksaw Ridge. Now imagine how the movie could have looked like with American soldiers tired, hungry, with rainy weather, stuck in their foxholes and all of a sudden there's explosions left and right. You know that if you stay in your foxhole, you, you might get blown up because the Japanese are very good at throwing grenades right at you. And if you go out of your foxhole, you're going to get blown up anyway. So I feel this is something they could have done and it doesn't take away from the cinematic experience. Funny when the Americans get hit, they can still fire their guns. They survive tens of shots, but the Japanese one shot, they're dead. Traditionally, Americans love to depict themselves as the outnumbered underdogs going against the odds in the face of a brazenly overpowered enemy. And I might cover this in a future video, but in this case, they're always the ones defending. Even though during World War II, and more specifically during the Battle of Okinawa, more often than not, they were the ones attacking. And I often get a recurrent comment saying, it's just a movie, it's for entertainment, and if you're not happy, just watch a documentary. But even you know that movies have much more influence than people credit them for. The fact that more people now know about the battle on top of the Maida escarpment because of the movie is good. But I bet you that the majority of people that watch the movie take it at face value and believe this is how things actually happened. How many will actually do the extra research about the battle to find out the truth? So in the end, this is what people believe. With that being said, let me know what you thought of my analysis. Did I miss anything? Do you agree, disagree? Let me know in the comments. This video was done as a collaboration with my friend Mike Ackerman. Mike is an artist and filmmaker who mainly focuses on World War II history in his work. He's currently making a World War II short movie based on a story involving Audie Murphy. And I have a lot of his artwork for sale on my website. They're all exceptional, but one of my favorite ones is this one, which shows the aftermath of a deadly Benzai attack. If you're interested, link is in the bio. And don't forget to like and subscribe.